Living in Virginia, you're in the fast lane on the information superhighway. We've invested $3 billion in Virginia's broadband network to give you one of the fastest internet connection speeds in the world, so you can build relationships, bring new business to our state, and meet the future of education. It's amazing what we can do together. Visit VCTA.com to learn how broadband connects the Commonwealth. From the General Assembly and the City of Richmond, I'm Woody Evans for Cable Reports, brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and Comcast, connecting Virginians to their government. We're really pleased to have two members of the House of Delegates with us this morning. Delegate Don Adams, welcome. Well, thank you. Mr. Chairman, Riley <laughs> Ingram, good to see you again, sir. Thank you, Woody. Thank you. Glad to be here. Delegate Adams, uh, what's the trans transition been like from private to public life? Wow, it's uh, really been um, a whirlwind and exciting and an honor and a privilege. Um, I, I have been primarily a clinician uh, most of my life. I'm a nurse practitioner. I also teach health policy um, uh, for nurses getting their doctorates and now I develop programs for the public sector. So getting into the public uh, arena of politics is a, a very, very different place, uh, but it's one that I think um, I'm well suited with my background and so it's been pretty exciting. Tell us a little bit about the makeup of your district, your constituents, sure. the, the demographics there. I represent uh, District 68 which is two and a half precincts of Enrico, uh, Northern Chesterfield and Richmond City. And um, we have a very diverse population. Um, very important issues include you know the environment and education. Uh, uh, we have a average age of 35 and um, People are very interested in their communities and their and their neighborhoods. So your uh, your seat was uh, an open seat, I believe. Uh, 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 the former delegate, I believe, he he retired or oh no, I... sir. Um, actually, we have um, our district has the honor of having the highest turnout in the state. Um, I ran against uh, Manoli Lupasi. Oh, okay, Manoli. And uh, okay. we had nearly forty thousand voters. Who was the one who requested uh, a recount? As yes, I sir, recall, yes, sir. Sure did. Yeah, 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 right. Now, now, what about your committee assignments? Um, I was given um, agriculture and, and natural resources in Chesapeake and militia. Great. And Mr. Chairman, you still have counties, cities, and towns. Counties, cities, and towns. I've been chairman of the committee. In fact, uh, I've been on that same committee. I've been on all my committees except for appropriations ever since I've been here. President elections and counties, cities, and towns ever since I've ever since 19 January of 1992. Uh, counties, cities, and towns. Uh, back when Republicans and Democrats were 50-50, um, you remember Frank Hall. Frank yes, Hall and sure. myself, and Frank, he was just a good guy. He really was. He was Democrat, I was Republican, but we, we just got along great, and we co-chaired county cities and towns uh, for like, I think it was about four, four years or so until 2002. And, uh, but Frank and I got along great, and, and, I, and you learn so much. On these different committees, you just learn a lot, and I'm still learning. I mean, I've been here 20, 25 years, and I'm still learning, Woody, it's, it, but it's a real experience all the time, and, uh, and then appropriations, and that's, that's where you really learn a lot, because the appropriations committee, that's where the money is spent, it goes through, and uh, I'm on four subcommittees on appropriations, and uh, I'm still on health and human resources, economic development, and uh, agriculture, and then um, capital outlay, and then plus the general government. And, uh, I think there, there's an interesting uh, change uh, on the appropriations committee. I believe Chris Jones yeah. appointed a Democrat for yes, the first he time did. to a subcommittee. Yes, and he, he's a great guy. He really is. He's smart. He does a great job, and I think that was really a, a good show of, of uh, partnership. And, and I think that uh, that is, that's the first as far as, as I know. I don't know of that ever happening before. 
when I first was elected, Woody, um, the Democrats out of a, uh, it was a 20-member committee, and now it's 22 members, but uh, when I first came in, it was 16 Democrats and only four Republicans on the on the committee, and uh, and that was the way you know that was the way it was. I mean, the Democrats were in control, and you realize that. And we would we would we would argue on the floor like unbelievable, but then we'd go up to the Holiday Inn on Franklin Street or somewhere, you know, and and everybody was just friendly, as, you know, friendly as they could be, and that was that was just the way it was. But it was it was. It was actually more fun then mm -hmm. than it is today, but uh, but I enjoy what I'm doing and I, I I do enjoy it. I really do. So, how have you been received here so far in terms of uh, collegiality? Not not only among your your new Democratic members, sure. but also the the Republicans. Everybody has been incredibly warm and welcoming. Um, you know, I think that uh, the ideas around partisanship are really small. Um, when it comes to legislating, I think you know we have some core issues that we just fundamentally disagree. But in general, people are interested in each other's um, efforts and helping each other. And um, I know for me, it's everything is new, so I uh, continually meet people and ask them questions. And everybody's been incredibly warm. Now, your, your back background as a NERC practitioner brings a, a level of expertise uh, that that will be very useful, especially in terms of healthcare issues. Uh, I, I know you're interested in Medicaid. Uh, Medicaid expansion. Uh, sure. Give us your point of view on that. Well, I think that Medicaid expansion is fiscally responsible if you just want to go there. And I think that's a, a, a case, uh, there's a case to be made for that that I think um, perhaps we could do a better job of, but I think we, we've tried, tried to do that. Um, I think that it's necessary uh, in the long run um, to save problems that patients have as a result of lack of care over time. I, I've actually practiced in um, uh, Delegate Ingram's neck of the woods. I was in uh, Southside uh, Regional Hospital for six years as a hospitalist. And honestly, some of the sickest patients I've ever seen came from that area because they weren't receiving primary care. They didn't have insurance coverage. And so by the time they came into the hospital, they had you know concomitant illnesses, meaning like m multiple illnesses where they were much sicker than had they gotten primary care. So what we know is that preventative care really does defray the costs that uh, people will have over time and also uh, decrease ER utilization. So let, let's make sure we understand what we're talking about sure. in terms of the expansion because mm -hmm. right now the, the majority of people are on Medicaid are women and children yes, and the elderly, I, I right. believe. Right. And this is really, Medicaid expansion is really looking at um, addressing uh, people that have a gap you know, between uh, being able to afford private insurance and being too poor, you know, to, to really fall into that, uh, you know, we have a super high, I think it's fifth or sixth in the nation high threshold for who is poor enough to qualify for Medicaid. So we're really talking about the working poor for, the, for many, many people and uh, people that may work two or three jobs but just don't have the ability to pay for um, one of the, the Medicaid plans that are, um, I'm sorry, the, the coverage plans that are offered. And of course, you're going to have to wrestle with this on appropriations. Yes. And as you pointed out, at one point, what, 22% of the budget 20, now goes to Medicaid? Would it 22% of the budget right now is for health care, okay? It's growing. Every year it continues to go up. Not just a million, it's millions of dollars every single year. The problem that I see, and I think that maybe there may be a compromise this year that's, that we can do something. The biggest problem that I see is the cost, what it's going to cost. And we have, but now in some cases we will be able to cut back on, we have free clinics all over the state where the people can go to have free health care, uh, prescription drugs, you know, that type thing. So I think that I'm all for helping everyone that I, you know, that we possibly can. I think that it's our job. The problem is, is who's going to pay for it? What is the cost going to be? The federal government, uh, the federal government, they said that they'll pay like 90% of it for a while, okay? What concerns me is what's going to happen, say, a year, two years, three years down the road. A lot of the states that have uh, implemented Medicaid already are running into financial problems because it's costing a lot more than what they thought it was going to I'd love to, to jump in on this. Yeah, because, go right um, ahead. Go ahead. Because I think this is really an important piece of it. Um, so we already, we already pay federal tax dollars, and that money was what we were looking to come back to us. Initially, it was at 100%. 
we lost something like $10.6 billion of money that we had already paid into the system. And the argument is, you know, how is it sustainable if that money goes away? But my thought is this, and I develop programs currently for the state, and what I did was a, a fiscal analysis, a cost analysis, and found out that, for example, dental care, which was costing three dollars to $6,000 a visit, could actually cost um, a tenth of that price. So I believe that we would do really well and serve our constituents well if we look, take this money and then hold companies accountable for outcomes and decreasing costs and, 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 and use this time to develop best practices around uh, cost reducing, cost saving plans, um, you know, looking at access to care, looking at who's providing care, looking at ensuring that people are practicing to the fullest ex uh, extent of their education and training so that we have provider access in rural areas where there isn't any now. And so I think if we hold our, if we go the route of MCOs and hold people accountable to quality based outcomes. Now what's an MCO? So oh, I'm sorry, a managed care organization okay. which currently um, mm -hmm. are, are those people sort of in charge of the overall care for people on Medicaid now mm -hmm. uh, through the CCC Plus program. Um, you know, if we do that, if we have, if we, if we say, let's use this time as almost a lap, you know, we're, 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 and we're creating expectations that you will drive down costs, you will increase quality outcomes, so that it is sustainable over time. I think that we could do a good job for everyone. It's a good point. However, okay. Federal government is famous for, uh, they do it with, with uh, uh, public safety, police departments, they send, they will say, we will put on, give you money for three more police officers, but it's only for two years. And then the locality has to pick it up, Woody. Then the taxpayers in the locality have to pick it up. The federal government right now is trillions and trillions of dollars in the hole. How can they continue to keep spending and spending and spending without being accountable for something. They don't have a balanced budget. They can just keep spending money and going further and further and owe China uh, uh, just millions and trillions of dollars. And China keeps, you know, China during there owns us because we owe so much money to China. However, having said all that, bus service, same thing. They'll come into a locality, they put bus service in, and they will fund that bus service. City of Hopewell is a prime example. City of Hopewell, they put bus service from Petersburg into Hopewell. Federal government paid for it, okay? Then the following year when we did the budget over there, then they had to spend a hundred and eighty some thousand dollars, then it went to two hundred and some thousand dollars. So who's gonna pay? So you you can't spend what you don't have. But we do have an opportunity, I think, to be leaders, you know, and I think that um, so, for example, I put in sort of a high-level thought-based bill called um, uh, a, a, a Commission for a Healthy Virginia. And the whole idea around that is to establish a legislative bipartisan commission that has a partnership with each member of the executive branch, the heads of the agencies and, and the private sector, and look at developing a, an overarching framework, right, for how Virginia um, uh, wants to be so as part of our constitution it doesn't just say you know we have a right to pursue life liberty and happiness it actually wants us to be successful in the Virginia Constitution and part to that end being healthy um, means like being able to live a quality life where we're functioning and happy and going to work and go, having a house and going to play and all of these things so if we have this commission and it essentially creates a mission and vision for how for for the Commonwealth to, so for how it becomes a healthy Virginia using what's called the structural and social determinants of health, which really looks at your quality of life. And then from that, we come up with policy drivers, resources, right? Like how we're gonna use our resources. And we, and we as a collective decide what the priorities are. We can start to be leaders in things like how the federal dollars affect us and how we're prioritizing our funds from the lens of becoming a more healthy commonwealth. We know what's interesting about this conversation is the interplay between state and local government and the federal government. And what's unfortunate are the kinds of things you point out. We just, we just saw a partial shutdown. Right. Thank goodness the Children's Health Insurance Program was funded exactly. again, but for another six years, right. one of the points you were making. Right. But, but talk to us about this continued dependence on Washington and the impact on the state of Virginia because we have the Pentagon, right. we've got I think 400 military inst installations, got lots of federal employees, contractors at the federal level. You're right, Woody, we have, uh, we 
have a lot of dependence here in Virginia on the federal government. Northern Virginia, the big companies up there that supply a lot of the needs up there. We have the uh, Navy, uh, Navy down in, in uh, the Tidewater area. Mm -hmm. We also have Newport News shipbuilding down there that rely on building aircraft carriers and things for our military. We depend a lot on the military. Now, last year in our budget, we did, uh, we're anticipating some of these things, but you remember last year, we, we anticipated a growth rate and we ended up in uh, like mid-year of a uh, $2.4 billion deficit, right. that we, a hole right. in the budget that we had to fill. This year we're taking a different look at, at it now, Woody, because what we're doing is we're going to, we're not going to re, uh, we're not going to say that we're going to get this much money, right, right. okay, because a lot of people paid their taxes and all in December mm -hmm. so that they could get it deducted because of, of the president's new um, tax, tax reform. Program. Right, yeah. right. And, uh, but on this, um, on this last shut down, so to speak, at least they've reached a compromise for the time being, and we'll see what, you know, what happens. Of course, uh, as of February 8th, the Congress may be back in the same position, so those fears, uh, again, may be rekindled for the state of Virginia and uh, its population. Sure, but at sure. least a tip has been carved out of that yes. debate, which is a good thing. Yes. And, you know, we, we do have to look at, I mean, we, we in Virginia, um, have a constitutional mandate for a balanced budget. So I think as we come at this in a smart uh, way, uh, we're going to have to look at, you know, what is the federal gov government offering in terms of funding and, and how, how do we best utilize that without putting us at risk. Uh, but I think we have to have these conversations that include caring for uh, our most vulnerable populations. And, um, you know, it's not people that are just hanging out that need the, the Medicaid, you know, coverage. It's people that, um, maybe can't get work because they don't quite qualify for disability, but they really are disabled. Or there are people that are working multiple jobs and they have health issues and, and it's gonna put them out of work. So I think part of it is in, in our economic interest to keep people healthy so that we can have um, you know, hardworking, uh, tax-paying citizens. Uh, privileges and elections, I think you just turned, you just returned from uh, a did. committee meeting. I did. Uh, Talk to us about that. So what I put in um, several bills, and one of the bills I put in was in response to this idea around um, voter uh, photo ID. And, um, you know, there are, there are two sides of it. There's concern about fraud. There's concern about voter suppression. And so um, what I put in, the bill I put in was to um, really highlight the fact that in Virginia we have free voter uh, photo ID, and yet it's really hard to find. I had uh, five different people of different educational levels uh, go on the website and try to figure out how to get a free voter ID, and everyone went to the DMV website. As it turns out, when you go there, you select ID card, and you end up with a fairly onerous process for proving who you are, and you have to pay between 2 and $15 a year. What my bill did was basically increase education and awareness on the website, an educational program, and potentially increase um, access points through the DMV as well as Registrar's Office 77. And then I had a secondary budget amendment to fund for one year in case uh, I had a fiscal impact on DMV and also created a license plate in a separate bill called I Have a Dream uh, to be the funding source for this educational campaign. It was killed because uh, I think it was uh, Delegate Fowler said it was a solution without a problem. But um, that's okay because I think that you know this year uh, I need to get pr maybe some more ducks in a row. The best part, though, is that I, and I still feel like it's a win for the Commonwealth. In talking with the DMV, the commissioner and the directors there, they are now going to put on the DMV website free voter ID, a very clear, and a link to the a state election uh, site, which um, is really actually kind of difficult to find. So I feel like, uh, at the very least, people will have a little more direct access to how they get to this voter ID. So I think that's a lesson learned that you learned over your last 30 years. Even if a bill fails, it can have a very positive impact. It can. It can, Woody, because what it does, it brings the attention of what a problem may be. And then, and it may take, uh, it may take three or four years before you actually get um, what, in other words, for example, I, I had a, a bill that I finally got through but it was um, it was 
check cashing. You remember that? Oh, yeah, I check remember the check cashing. Bill. Yes. And I went through and went through and could not get it passed, but all I wanted was just some form of identification. And I fought that for, I know, three years, and we finally passed it with a, some form of identification. Now, that had to do with people who were actually committing fraud against elderly That's folks. That's correct, right. 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 In other words, right. I had, how, what brought it to my, attention, well, to my attention was it wasn't just one, but one particular one I remember was a lady in Petersburg, and her son worked over at the plant in Hopewell, and he called me and he said, um, Riley, you've got to help me. I said, what is it? He said his mother was just ripped off for $2,000. And I said, what? He said, yeah. He said, a man came up with a red pickup truck. I have a red pickup truck. <laughs> and I'm thinking, what? <laughs> anyway, and he said, uh, came up with a red pickup truck and said that she was going to put siding on, on the outside shed and was going to put new gutters on her house and do all this stuff. He said she, that for th like $3,000. And he said, it's no way that she, he could do all that. Said it was probably eight or ten thousand dollar job, but he needed a two thousand dollar deposit so that he could go get the materials. Well, she wrote him a check. He took the check to a ca check cashing place, mm -hmm. cashed it right away, and it just sucks it right out of your account like yeah. you do at a, at a, a store somewhere, Macy's or wherever. And so, by the time he told her to, he said, and I told her to stop paying on the check. He said she stopped. She called a bank within 20 minutes after she gave him that check. The check had already been cashed mm -hmm. and had no identification, no nothing. And, and that we finally cured. Well, we haven't cured it. It's just sure. that we have slowed it down. They do have to show some form of identification sure. now. Well, but that bill was hard to get through, but we, mm -hmm. we did. So it took about two or three sessions it, to get that it, one through? It did. So a lot of times, don't get discouraged oh, yeah, if you not, don't get something passed right away. You have to keep, you have to keep going and prove sure. to the delegates and the senators over here that, yep. that it's, it's something that really does need to be done sure. to protect Absolutely. the people. Absolutely. So what does it mean to you and, and, and other new uh, women delegates that there are so many more women now here? I think <clears> half the 15 who were newly elected are, are women. I think that, um, I think we're all just super grateful that, you know, we're catching up and being more representative of the larger commonwealth, the larger population. Um, there's more diversity in a, uh, a, a diverse voice. And, and so when we have more perspectives, we certainly can, I think, do a better job to, to meet the needs of the over, over, you know, arching commonwealth. And so I think we're all um, very excited. I also think that, um, Women and men, you know, just sort of innately have a different communication style, and so I think uh, we, we're going to bring, um, you know, a, diff a different way of, of, of having conversations, and um, I'm hoping that that will enrich um, uh, our policy making uh, by having, um, you know, just uh, maybe a little more um, uh, person-centric, person sure. you know, how, how it's affecting families, you know, when, we, when we're talking about policy, you know, what is the real impact on a person? Um, so, I'm hoping that you know we'll bring a, a, a gentleness to that back to politics that I think that everyone longs for, whether you're male or female. You know, we're kind of looking for the collegiality in conversation. Um, at least uh, I know that the people in my district that I've spoken to are really uh, tired of the divisiveness and the lack of respect, and I think uh, we do uh, a poor job of of um, demonstrating how young people should interact if we're, if we're not treating each other with a kindness and respect and at least the dignity of, of, of listening to each other. So has the collegiality improved, you think, Riley? Well, I, 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 was, just, I was just sitting here thinking, Woody. The, um, the fact of the matter is a lot of people on the outside, they look at us and they think that we are just making laws over here to make their lives uh, worse and everything else. but. But you know, our biggest job is to help people. Uh, in my opinion, my job over here is to be the people's voice to, you know, to let them know that we are here to serve them. Also, so many times uh, people have problems with uh, getting a car title to their car. And uh, I had one gentleman there in Hopewell that had an old model, they forward that he bought way out in Kansas somewhere, brought it back on a trailer. He had it for over 20 years, but he didn't get a bill of sale from the man that he bought it from, the farmer that sold it to him. 
And uh, of course the farmer was already gone, he couldn't get anything from him. So I, I was able to get him a, a, a title. To, I do think the, the collegiality though yeah. has, 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 is, is good. I mean, I was really fortunate to have a constituent that reached out to me. Um, he had been working with our former delegate on a bill and I was able to pick that bill up and then um, have conversations with it about the form, uh, with the former delegate as well as uh, Senator Sturdivant. And um, we're looking to ensure that we protect uh, workers whose pensions have been sold uh, secondarily into annuities and making sure that um, their federal protections are not um, removed. So I, I think that these conversations that help improve the quality and the life of, uh, of our community are, are ones that we can um, come together and uh, make good policy towards. Uh, Virginia is known for its number of veterans. I think they constitute about 10% of, sure. uh, of the, the Commonwealth. Uh, talk to us about uh, the needs of, of our veterans here in the state. Oh, there's a number of needs, and, and, and in my district in particular, it doesn't is not uh, veteran-centric, although I grew up in the military, and so it's a, an issue that's very important to me. Um, we certainly have mental health needs uh, that we have to address, as well as the long-term care needs of our, our veterans. We, I know that we have uh, two new uh, long-term care facilities that are being um, uh, that have been funded and, and are being built. And we'll need to look at also, you know, community wraparound services so that uh, we're making sure we support people who have um, different effects of, of not just living life, but also as a result of going to war. Uh, so I think uh, the mental health needs uh, need to be addressed, and then uh, certainly employment issue, issues and making sure that they can find jobs and translate their skills that they learned in the military into the private sector. Community colleges play a role in that, don't they? Yes, Woody, no question. Community colleges, they're working with the military. Also, the military retirees or the, the coming out of the military, the, the state jobs, uh, they, the state is hiring a lot of the military retirees and the military people that have served in the military, whether it be for two years, four years, six years, or whatever. And so that is a big thing. And our community colleges are helping not just the military, but they're helping a lot of other people in um, training as far as welders, plumbers, electricians, all these skills that make good money, and uh, that I think that's important too. And uh, our military veterans returning from theaters of war have an opportunity now through our community colleges to get credit right. for service and experience right. that uh, that they have now. Right, right, um, uh, definitely. I think I was out at uh, John, John uh, J. Sergeant Reynolds and, right. and talking about their programs, and um, we have a number of really strong uh, John Tyler. We have a number of strong community colleges in our community. Yes. Um, and I know that they are really looking to uh, transition not only the military skills, but also um, uh, look at how we can take people who are, have been displaced because their uh, field of service is not as uh, well um, established anymore and, and training them into alternative uh, skills uh, such as uh, industries that pay high, like, like healthcare, for example. Well, thank you so much for being here again, uh, Delegate uh, Riley Ingram and Delegate Don Adams. Good luck. Uh, and Mr. Chairman, keep the thank good you. work up and you. you keep fighting. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching Cable Reports, brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and Comcast. Until next time, I'm Woody Evans. <laughs>